The New Climate Change and Presidential Climate Deception The following information came from the book, They Knew, Internet Searches, and My Experiences. I'm Ed Evans, Climate Deception Channel. I do not enjoy sounding partisan, but that's the history handed to me and many folks in the United States. What American Presidents Knew Johnson, Nixon, Ford Introduction In the 1950s and 1960s, scientists warned that the new climate change became apparent. Notable scientists such as Gaius Callender, Roger Revelle, Gilbert Plass, and Charles D. Keeling produced reliable and detailed charts. These measure the carbon dioxide atmospheric concentrations shown on the Keeling curve. Today, the above scientists' findings remain observable, reproducible, falsifiable, and peer-reviewed. What else do we need to act on the greatest threat to humanity, ever? Final Warning Yet, over a generation passed before we received the final warning. In 2021 the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, rang the alarm, Code Red. So how did we arrive at Code Red and, still, no Manhattan-like project exists to combat climate change? Look to the simple answer from philosophy, intergenerational moral corruption, passed from generation to generation. And it continues to this day for nuclear weapons and the new climate change. In 1960 the National Science Foundation created the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR. Both UCLA and the RAND Corporation created a computer modeling laboratory, and the RAND Corporation serves the U.S. military, and would receive funding from the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. Computer systems ramped up programs focused on understanding and developing atmosphere-ocean climate models. Their goal was to understand the meaning of increasing concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide parts per million, CO2 ppm. Also, the Office of Naval Research funded science relating to climate change. President Carter and all following presidents would benefit from advanced computer modeling systems created in the 1960s. Some baby boomers will recall the IBM 650 business computer, its seemingly magical power to calculate great amounts of information. Wall Street types use computer models daily. President Carter benefited from computer technology as did all following presidents. It only gets more powerful. Today, climate scientists, as well as atmospheric scientists, benefit from computer technology and computer modeling. Computer models allow climate scientists to model known past climates quickly. Their findings help predict future climates based on the past. Historic climate models also help climate scientists calibrate their computer models as they change climate conditions, variables. It works well, dandy. Johnson 1963 to 1969 By 1965 climate change became most evident to the United States government. President Johnson had key reports on climate change to refer to in November 1965. Responding to the Environmental Pollution Panel of the President's Science Advisory Committee, he was the first president to sound the alarm on atmospheric carbon dioxide pollution. The National Science Foundation published the report Weather and Climate Modification, Report of the Special Commission on Weather Modification. Weather modification means human change climate, which we now call the Anthropocene. We call this era the Anthropocene because humans are now the single source of climate change, not geography. The Weather and Climate Modification Report stated that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere increased 10 to 15 percent in the 20th century. These changes were causing severe heat imbalances. Nixon 1969 to 1974 President Nixon had the same climate change information as President Johnson and more. As science advanced and atmospheric carbon dioxide density increased, the evidence became stronger. Computer climate models became more accurate. Additionally, in 1970 President Nixon stated in his annual plan for participation in the World Weather Program, in the longer term, the quality of the atmosphere may determine whether man survives or perishes. And President Nixon's director of the Office of Science and Technology said that, the federal government must play a leadership role, because these efforts are so large, 
and so long-term that the fragmented power industry cannot be expected to do the job itself. Interestingly, Dr. David moved to Exxon soon after leaving the Nixon administration. Note, we have no cause to believe that Dr. David acted in bad faith with his move to Exxon. Incidentally, he later wrote a textbook on physics for high school students. I make the point because revolving doors exist for personnel changes. U.S. government, corporations, and the military-industrial complex scratch one another's back. President Eisenhower warned us that government employees sometimes leveraged their government contacts to enhance corporate advantages. It continues today. Example, how many fossil fuel executives visit the White House Oval Office or become secretaries to the president, then, how many climate scientists share these same seats of influence? In any case, we know that by 1979, Exxon new greenhouse gases add to global warming, the cause of climate change by increasing the Earth's greenhouse gas, atmospheric insulation. See the links below. 1967 The U.S. Department of Commerce reported that the Panel on Electrically Powered Vehicles recommended that admissions standards be set for vehicles. Two months later, President Nixon wrote to his Director of Office of Science and Technology regarding the UNESCO Conference on the Environment, Man in the Environment, A View Toward Survival, on the obligation and responsibility of government to protect future generations from global climate change and polluted oceans. Baby boomers may also recall the name John Ehrlichman from the Watergate escapades. John Ehrlichman pursued the development of non-internal combustion engines, EV, electric vehicles. Change was in the wind. I'm saying that John Ehrlichman researched internal combustion machines and EVs back in 1968. So Ehrlichman knew the importance of electric cars and the dangers of ICE machines for our national energy system. So, a Republican president, President Nixon, sought to make liberal adjustments to the American energy system, a liberal fix. Maybe this wasn't a liberal fix, it made such a good sense that it did not need political labels. Standing in the way of these liberal adjustments, right-wing politicians pushed a halt to change the status quo, business as usual. There is too much money to lose burning fossil fuels and creating ice machines. Yep, we need to look no further to answer the question, what happened? Fossil fuel subsidies also paid billions of dollars to suck fossil fuels out of the earth. Plus, externalizing the costs to future generations explain American intergenerational moral corruption. Simply pass the buck, kick the can down the road, to use metaphors. American exceptionalism was not so exceptional, after all. As for other nations, such as China and India, Catch-up became their rationale for intergenerational moral corruption. They externalized the cost of fossil fuels to the future to cash in the best thing to next to free lunch. Ford 1974-1977 Ford administration gets credit for creating a first corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE standards. So again, we see that some Republicans understood the crisis at hand, and these Republicans had done the right thing. They were practicing intergenerational moral responsibility by caring for future life on Earth. Before we get too excited about the Republican Party not standing in the way of combating climate change, I want to point out that the Ford administration gets credit for creating a first corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE standards. So again, we see that some Republicans understood the crisis at hand, and these Republicans had done the right thing. They were practicing intergenerational moral responsibility, but weakly. Today, climate deception continues worldwide.